Hey, 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 it's your girl, Carla Renata, a.k.a. The Curvy Film Critic. Welcome back to another episode of The Curvy Critic with Carla Renata. And I would be that person. I'm your host. <laughs> so welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, what I do here, if this is your first time here, is I do film reviews and interviews with people that are above and below the line in the film industry. So if this is your first time joining me, please give me a big old thumbs up to let me know that you were here and we're gonna go ahead and get right into it. So I always start out the show giving you a recap of my week. You know, we're in COVID, we're in quarantine. Some things are starting to come back slowly but surely. And People are starting to go to work as I did this week, but I'll get to that in a minute. So I wanted to talk first and foremost about, I know I had ended the show last week saying that I was going to be doing something for Blog Her, and I didn't get a chance to do that because of scheduling conflicts. Conflicts. So stay tuned. I will eventually be doing something else with Blog Her moving forward. It's just, it just wasn't last week. So, but I highly suggest going to the Blog Her site to hear what the two young ladies, Tiffany and Jennifer, had to say about branding. So there's that. I also took a little trip out. I took my mom out on a little trip to the drive in. Hi, Kazuza. I took my mom on a little trip to the drive in. Uh, cause she has literally has not been out of the house since March. And I took her to see a film called time. We went to the Paramount drive-in in the city of industry. We had our mask on our Afrocentric mask on that I like to say, and we got our grub and our giggle on while we enjoyed a flick outside of the house. So that was a lot of fun. And I'll talk more about time in a minute. So you guys know that I'm also an actress that I recur on Superstore, which is on NBC. I play the role of Janet. And thank you, Kazuza. I know my mommy's cute. Um, I play the role of Janet on Superstore, and they have started season six. They started shooting last month, but this week was my first time going. And child, let me tell you, it was stressful. It was a little stressful because we had to get the COVID test, and we had to be cleared from the COVID test before we had to shoot. You got to get your temperature taken. You're in isolation most of the time. It's a very different way to shoot things. I'm glad that NBC is airing on the side of caution. But it is very stressful, but I'm happy to be back there for season six. And we have a lot of shenanigans coming your way, addressing a lot of the things and issues that have been plaguing America right now. Hi, Brandon. Yes, Soul is coming to Disney. Barrel is coming to Disney Plus. All of that is coming. And I will bring you all the news about it when I get it right here. I did a little story on Soul about... Um, what I saw when I got invited to a little sneak peek version of that. I'll talk about it toward the end of the show. And then I also attended a Welcome to the Blumhouse premiere. Now y'all know I am not the girl for horror. I do not like horror movies. I don't like anything in the vein of horror. But when I had Felicia Rashad on last week, we talked about her film Black Box, which was part of the Welcome to the Blumhouse series. So her film and a film called The Lie premiered last week. And then they have two other films. I think one is called Evil Eye and the other one is called Nocturne that are going to premiere this weekend, this coming weekend, the 16th and the 17th, I believe. I might have those dates wrong. But baby, that virtual premiere was a lot of fun. They had a tarot card reader. They had you go, they had this house and you went from house, from floor to floor to floor in this house to play these games. It was, it was a little more terrifying than the movie was. So I had to duck up out of there because I couldn't take it because I'm a wuss, as you know, as I say all the time. So there's that. But that was how my week went. So let me tell y'all about this movie time that I saw. It is going to be on Amazon Prime Video this week on the 16th, October 16th on Prime Video. It is directed by um, Bradley Garrett. Bradley Barrett, Barrett, Barrett. I'll get her name right, but I think her name is, I think her name is Barrett. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Barrett. I totally messed up your name, but her name is Barrett. And she directed this documentary on Amazon Prime about this woman named Fox Rich. Fox Rich is married to Rob G. Rich. They are from NOLA, New Orleans. They ran up on some rough times and they decided that they needed to rob a bank in order to make their life better. And them making that decision cost them 20 years of anguish. Rob got sentenced to 60 years in prison 
Fox got sentenced to 20 years and I think she got out in 12. That's ridiculous. Murderers don't even get that kind of time. You know what I'm saying? I felt some kind of way when I found out that that was the situation. Not only that, but by the time they decided they were gonna put Fox behind bars, she was pregnant. She has six boys. Now think about that. She raised 20, I'm sorry, she raised six boys in 20 years by herself. Think about what it's like to have one child. She had six children that she raised by herself. When I tell you this woman is anointed, this woman is anointed. She is a wonderful speaker. She has become an activist. She is out there trying to encourage and inspire other women that have made poor decisions like herself and help them get on the right road post-incarceration so that they don't have to spend their whole life being branded. Because at one point in the United States, you were not able to vote if you were incarcerated. If you had been incarcerated, you were not able to vote. In some states, they have lifted those restrictions. So if there's somebody out there listening to this that is that is in that lane, please, please, please make sure that you get out and vote. But when I tell you that this documentary was everything. It was everything. And it was inspiring. And it proves one thing. So it's called time. And it's called time for a reason. This woman did nothing but spend time working tirelessly to get her husband out of jail. She spent nothing but time raising six young, capable, articulate, intelligent, young Black men in a society that is not built for them. She spent time waiting for her husband to come home to help her continue to raise those Black men. So having said all that, I suggest that y'all take some time on Amazon Prime Video on October 16th and check out the documentary Time, which is streaming this week. All right. So the next film that I saw was this film called The Devil All the Time. Now, it's currently streaming on Netflix. It's been on Netflix for about two or three weeks. It stars Robert Pattinson. Y'all know him from the Twilight franchise. When I tell you Robert Pattinson is, is, is embarking into this lane where he is taking on these characters that are so not like that franchise he's been so strongly identified with, I kid you not. And in this film, he plays one of those preachers, you know, the ones that talk a whole bunch of smack and always go toward the weakest lamb in the bunch for the slaughter, so to speak. He was that person. Now, I grew up in the Church of God in Christ when I was a kid, and we weren't allowed to curse. We weren't allowed to wear makeup. We weren't allowed to wear lipstick. We weren't allowed to wear pants. We had to say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. And it was a very strict upbringing that I had growing up. In addition to that, people spoke in tongues when they were in church and everything revolved around the church. We were in church 24 seven, every day of the week, all the time. This movie shows what happens to those people. You can go to church all you want to, but when the devil decides he's going to come for you, the devil is going to come for you. And it's a really sad story. It's about this young boy whose mother gets cancer. Her fa His father can't handle it. He ends up killing himself. The mother ends up dying, and this boy ends up going to live with this really religious family who... Um, takes very good care of him, but then he ends up on a path of his own where he ends up replicating the past, so to speak, in, some very, in a very bizarre, strange twist of events. I don't, I'm being very vague about it because I don't, I want you to see it because it's worth seeing and it's a very strange movie. It's really strange and really crazy, but it's directed by Anthony Campos. It's written by Anthony Campos. It stars Robert Pattinson, and it is on Netflix right now. The next film that I saw is a film called Cutthroat City. And Cutthroat City is directed by RZA. RZA is a hip hop artist that has been in the directing lane for quite some time. This is his third film that he's directed. But what I liked about this film is the fact that it is dealing with a post-Katrina world that we've never really seen. Whenever you see Hurricane Katrina, you see people on roofs waving and trying to get um, 
attention with these signs. You see broken highways that it, you see pictures of New Orleans that look almost post-apocalyptic, right? But this delves into the story of these four young men. One wants to be a musician, one wants to be an artist, one is a drug dealer, and one is a dog trainer. It stars Shamik Moore, who you guys will recognize from Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. He did the voice of Spider-Man for that Sony Pictures Oscar-winning film. But he plays the artist in this film. And th these four guys, they're friends, and they have all been affected by Hurricane Katrina, and they're all trying to figure out how they're going to navigate their way out of it. They end up aligning forces with another person who is a drug dealer and he poses the position to them of hey if you pull off this this robbery right here then i will give you a piece of pie and you know whenever that happens in a movie or in real life the results are never good they never turns out good for anybody involved right so it reminds me of a film that i saw a long time ago called set it off it's like a male version of set it off which is one of my favorite favorite films that start Queen Latifah, Kimberly Elise, um, Jada Pinkett Smith, and I can't remember the fourth doll, but there were four black women, they were best friends, and they end up robbing this bank and they all end up, you know, leaning into their demise toward the end of the, of the situation. This kind of reminds me of that, but with, with men doing it and in a, a post Hurricane Katrina kind of world, if you can imagine all of that. It's a lot of drama going on. I love the dialogue because it's the way that Black people actually talk. There is finally a movie where Black people are talking the way we actually talk. And it's not some, you know, made up um, urban lingo that somebody thinks we talk like. And it, it actually is the way we speak. I could have done without the N-word a few less times. But that aside, RZA does a great job directing it. It's a really good film. It, there's some ebbs and flows where it's a little slow here and there, but for the most part, it's a really good film. And I suggest checking it out. It's streaming online now. I think you can find it via um, Voodoo. The next film that I'm going to talk about is a film that is going to be streaming on Netflix this week. It is called The Trial of the Chicago Seven. Now The Trial of the Chicago Seven is a film that is very, very intense and is very apropos for what's going on in the world right now. We're on the eve of an election. We have so many different things politically that are going down that is just it, like you wake up and you never know politically what's going to happen. It's just bananas on a daily basis. But this particular film this is a story of seven people that were on trial um, and it stems from them What's the best way for me to say this? It stems from them uh, organizing protests that are happening at the 1968 Democratic National Convention. So there's a lot going on in 1968, right? We got troops over in Vietnam, Richard Nixon becomes president, and then we got this trial centered around these protesters, these organizers that include everybody from Bobby Seale from the Black Panthers to um, Tom Hayden, a young Tom Hayden. Um, it is a deep film. It is directed and written by Aaron Sorkin. Aaron Sorkin, you guys know his name from The West Wing, Newsroom, um, Molly's Game with um, Je uh, Jessica Chastain. And it's just, it's a really intense, <laughs> it's an intense film. It is really intense. It deals with all these different situations. And the most, the most Puzzle, not puzzling, the most prolific thing about it is that there is a scene in the film that really wore me out. And I'm going to be talking to Aaron Sorkin. So I'll have an interview with him here next week. And hopefully I will have an, an opportunity to ask him this question. But I'm not sure exactly how much of the transcripts they used to put this film together. I'm going to find out. But there is a scene in the film where Bobby Seals is repeatedly asked by the, the judge to not jump up with outbursts and speeches, right? The judge gets to the point where he's had enough. He's tired of asking nicely. And he literally has the bailiffs take Bobby Seal in the back, bound and gag him, and bring him back out for the trial. And then he proceeds to ask him, do you think you can sit here 
for the rest of this trial without any disruption. He says, do your head left and right for no, do it up and down for yes. Bobby Seal goes like this, and this judge literally has this black man bound and gag in a court of law in the United States of America during a trial for hours. That's ridiculous. And it made me feel some kind of way, but it's so indicative of where the world was in 1968. And the scary thing is this is 2020 and we're not that far away from it, right? So if anything else, you should watch that film just to hear about this trial. It's called The Trial of the Chicago 7. It literally was eight, but Bobby Seale was not legally provided with legal representation, even though he repeatedly asked for it. And so there was a mistrial declared in his case. Therefore, it's called The Trial of the Chicago 7. So I just wanted to make that distinction because I was like, it's a lot of people. I think it's more than seven people. And then I found out that that was what the situation was, that Bobby Seale's case was dismissed. And that's why um, there's all these people. But it was an uprising. There was a whole situation that happened between the protesters and the National Guard and the police. And it got really ugly. People got hurt. People got killed. This is the year for political um projects and uh, people bringing light to the injustices and the inequality that happens in our United States of America. So hopefully moving forward, we will see some change. I'm hoping that the BLM protests that have occurred um, are not a distant memory. I hope the people make it their business not to let it fade into the background because we have a tendency to do that. Something happens, we get all fired up, we got our pom-poms ready, we got our you know protest signs ready, and then a couple of weeks or a couple of months into whatever that issue is, it kind of just fades by the wayside. So I'm hoping that people watch the trial of the Chicago 7 written and produced by Aaron Sorkin on Netflix this week if nothing else, to be reminded of history, because I say this all the time on The Curvy Critic with Carla Renata. If you don't acknowledge history, you are always doomed to repeat it. Now, having said that, I want to talk a little bit about Pete Souza and Laura Dern. I love Laura Dern so much, and I was so excited when she won the Oscar for Marriage Story earlier this year. She is always been very politically active. She has always been very outspoken. So have her parents, uh, Bruce Dern and Jenna Rollins. So I, in saying that, I was really excited to see that she was attached to this project the way I see it, which centers around Pete Souza. If you're not familiar with Pete Souza, Pete Souza is <laughs> what you say, Michael B., you just saw Laura Dern interview and thought I was done. No, 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 I'm not done. Um, so I, uh, cause I usually do post the interviews after I'm done. So there's that. But anyway, um, Pete Souza was the white house photographer during the Reagan administrations and during the Obama administrations, two of the most polarizing administrations to ever hit the white house in modern history, other than the one that's there right now. And so he was, um, what's the word I want to look for? He, he was, given the task of being able to capture these men, their lives politically and personally without bias. And he does so expertly, affectionately, lovingly, and very classy. So this documentary centers around him, how he got into photography, how he ended up at the White House, and how he eventually ended up having this documentary. So I sat down and I spoke with them for about three minutes, I guess it was, to talk about how they ended up doing this documentary, why they ended up doing this documentary, and why I think it's important. So take a look and a listen to this interview with Pete Souza and Laura Dern for The Way I See It. You guys have both become politically involved lately, right? Through this project, The Way I See It. Pete, through your pictures, and Laura, through producing this film. What made you guys feel the need to speak out now? But at this particular moment, we are all about to have the opportunity to vote. And more than ever, um, it matters. Uh, and Pete's work has extraordinarily archived for us through two presidencies, what leadership, what the respect for the office 
look like and what empathy looks like in the face of one's fellow man um, walking through all kinds of challenge. Um, and I am grateful forever for his work and thrilled to be part of this doc and, and for everyone's push, including focus to make sure that um, people can see it before uh, we vote. I think it's a gorgeous reminder of, of the privilege of getting to uh, demand that kind of leadership for our lives. And for me, I think I've been speaking out since the day after I left the White House, maybe in a subtle way on, on Instagram, but um, I, I felt compelled enough, um, you know, to let people know that um, the presidency is an important office and we needed somebody in there with dignity that had dignity and respect. And I love that you were throwing shade. It was giving me life all day long. I was throwing shade right there with you because this is, we're living in a time where we have to throw shade. We have to, we have no choice. Pete, of, I know that a lot of your memories, honorable, memorable, and stressful were located within the confines of the documentary, but what's in the documentary that we won't find that was a stressful or really memorable moment for you? Well, I think the stressful moments were really anytime uh, we, President Obama had to meet with uh, families who were involved in some sort of tragedy, whether it be mass shooting or, um, you know, some natural disaster. So, I mean, we highlight what happened in Newtown in some ways, which is representative of, of you know, the many times we had to do things like that. Uh, and I think those were just the, the, you know, probably the most emotional and, and stressful times for me. Well, you guys, I'm running toward the end of my time, but I wanted to take that time to thank both of you for putting this film out into the world. It's so necessary. It's so important. It's so well done, absolutely meticulously produced and directed. And that would not be possible had it not been for the photographs that you have shot, Pete Souza. So thank you so very much. And thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for saying that. I really appreciate it. It's the and truth. thank you for lending your voice to, uh, to spreading the word. That's, that's so important. Bless you. That's what I'm here for, Mama. Woohoo! Bye. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is what I'm here for. It, I am here to spread the word and to encourage people to vote, 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 vote. My mother and I, we got our ballots this week. I was very excited by that. And um, we're going to sit down after I finish this show and we're going to go through our choices and figure out where to drop it off so that we can cast our vote. And I encourage you to do the same. I want to wish Brandon a happy 26th birthday. You No, you turn, yeah, you turn 26 on the 30th. So happy pre-birthday. When you come back on the 30th, I'll say, I'll sing happy birthday to you as a special kind of thing. I'll be like, happy birthday, Brandon. Yay. Um, we'll do that. And then, um, yeah, Michael B., I, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I'll fix that. But that was it for this show, you guys. I know that went really fast. I'm really trying hard to come in as close to 5.30 as I possibly can because I don't want to take up that much time on your Sunday and I just want to hit it and quit it. Um, so let me just reiterate what we talked about. We talked about Time, a documentary for Amazon Prime, which will be streaming on Prime Video on October 16th. Also on October 16th, there will be streaming The Trial of the Chicago 7 at Netflix. Also streaming at Netflix already is The Devil All the Time with Robert Pattinson. And also streaming on platforms all over the place is Cutthroat City directed by RZA. Now next week, as I mentioned a little earlier, I will be talking to Aaron Sorkin who is the writer and director of the trial of the Chicago seven. I will speak, be speaking with him. I will finally, finally, finally have my girl Dawn Porter, who is the director of the way I see it. And we can talk to her a little more in depth about that particular project in a way that I didn't get to talk to Laura or Pete about. And um, what else are we doing? Oh, 
and uh, the AFI Film Festival gets underway. So I will be doing a recap of that. But until that happens next week, let me tell you all about some stuff that is going to be showing at the AFI Film Festival. It happens between October 15th and the 22nd. Usually this festival happens in Los Angeles and they don't do anything virtually. You can't stream anything. But again, because of the pandemic, a lot of the film festivals have been streaming virtually, and I've attended quite a few of them. The Bentonville Film Festival I attended virtually, the Toronto Film Festival I attended virtually, the AFI Docs Film Festival I attended virtually, and I will be attending the AFI Film Festival as well. So one of the films that is opening this week, I think on October 16th, is a film called Really Love. I cannot wait to see that. It, it, it's been so much hype on it. I can't wait to see it. So be looking out for that. Winston Duke from Black Panther and Get Out has a film that's going to be streaming called Nine Days. The, film, the festival opens on the 15th with a film called I'm Your Woman, and it closes. Are y'all ready? The AFI Film Festival is going to close with One Night in Miami the Regina King directed film that I talked about a little while ago when I did Toronto. Y'all really want to try to make your way to see that. Um, also, I wanted to tell you guys about Wolf Walkers because Brandon, I know that's his jam. Wolf Walkers is coming to Apple TV Plus, but before it comes to Apple TV Plus, it is coming to you at the AFI Film Festival. So it's an animated film that was made in Ireland it's going to be the bomb.com. You really want to check it out. To check out all of the films that you want to see at the AFI Film Festival, they charge you per film. The prices are very, very reasonable. You sign up for an account at eventlive.com once you, you know, go and put your information in at the AFI website. And you guys can festival with me and we can discuss it together. So again, the AFI Film Festival will be happening from October 15th through the 22nd, online, virtually, please go to that site, AFI, I think it's AFI Fest or AFI.org to get your tickets and go through the list to see what you want to watch. Rita Moreno and Mina Nahir are two, Mira Nahir are two of the people that are going to be honored with special awards at the AFI Film Festival, and I'm really, really looking forward to it. I also wanted to give a shout out to Tribeca and through her lens, they are doing a three-day women's filmmaker program um, in association with Chanel, um, where they're doing some one-on-one -on -one mentoring and intimate master classes virtually. And the women involved in that project are people like Angela Bassett, Yara Shahidi, her mama Carrie Shahidi, Annette Benning, Gina Prince Blythewood, Alexis Fogel, and Marty Noxon are among some of the women that are mentoring and or judging. So again, go to at Chanel on Twitter or Instagram or go to or just type in through her lens and you'll be able to get more information about that project. That brings us to the end of the show. Yay. And I'm right on time with like a couple of minutes to spare. So again, if this is your first time here, please give me a thumbs up to let me know that you were here. I appreciate you taking time out of your day, out of your weekend to come and hang with me for a little bit. I hope that you're able to check out all of the films that I highlighted this week. I have a whole plethora of films that I will be talking about next week. And again, those interviews with Aaron Sorkin and Don Porter. I am your girl, Carla Renata, a.k.a. The Curvy Film Critic. And this is The Curvy Critic with Carla Renata. Until the next time, I will catch you on the flip side. Deuces.